All of the early computers we've looked at so far have been based on the Intel 8080 processor. But the 8080 was not the only processor released in 1974. Motorola released their 6800 processor the same year, just a few months after the 8080 came out. For all practical purposes, the two uh, processors are basically the same thing. They're both 8-bit processors, 64K of address space. Uh, they're both in a 40-pin dip. Total throughput or processing capability of the two chips is pretty much the same. So if you could design a computer around the 8080, you could also design one about around the 6800, and it would have similar uh, capabilities as the 8080 computer. So what we have here on the left is uh, one of the first computers designed around the 6800. This is the Southwest Technical Products 6800. It came out in the fall of 75, a little over six months after the Altair came out. And, well, the Altair started shipping. Um, about that same time in 1975, the first clone of the Altair came out as well. That was the MSI 8080. So here at the end of 1975, going into 1976, there was three main computers on the market, the Altair and the MSI based on the 8080, and then this Southwest Technical Products based on Motorola 6800. Now, if you were comparing these, the first thing you'd notice is the 6800 doesn't have all the lights and switches of the Altair or the MSI front panel. Now, those switches and lights were primarily used to examine memory, change memory, and uh, set an address for execution and jump to it. In the 6800, that was done with a ROM monitor instead. Uh, you basically hit the power button to turn it on, and you could hit reset to restart the ROM monitor whenever you want. Um, from the monitor prompt, you could specify any address, see what was in that con in that location, and change it. So as you might expect, typing on your teletype or on a terminal uh, was a quicker and less error prone than putting in programs and changing memory locations with the front panel and all the lights. Now, from a nostalgic point of view, looking back, yeah, there's something uh, very desirable about all those lights and switches. But in the day, you've probably been happy to have something that was quicker and easier to use. And frankly, the ROM monitor with a keyboard was actually um, a more efficient way to get programs in in those early days when it was uh, just bare bones computing. The other main difference is the Southwest technical product computer. You got a lot more bang for the buck than the MSI or the Altair. Even though the starting price of all these was in the low 400 range, by the time you outfitted them the same, uh, the 6800 was almost half the price of the Altair. And we'll take a look at that in just a little bit as we dig into the inside. So the 6800 is a good example of value engineering, in my opinion. Um, a lot of things were done to make it affordable and simple without really cutting corners in terms of reliability or performance or capability. And we'll see more of that as we dig into this. All right, we're going to do a video cut here and we'll take the top off of this computer and uh, see what makes it tick on the inside. Before we take the top off and look inside, let's actually take a look at the top. As you can see, it's fully perforated. This allowed for cooling without a fan. Even with a full set of cards, the cooling was sufficient that you didn't need a fan. So there's one less thing to pay for, one less thing to break. And of course, it's always nice not having to listen to the noise of that fan running. Although you probably had a teletype or something else going, so it was still noisy. All right, I'll remove that top and take a look inside. This computer is outfitted pretty much the same as the original systems that you could buy for $395. So you get the computer chassis that you see here, and it has a full power supply. It gave 10 amps on the eight volt supply from which everybody derived their five volts. Up here in the front is the CPU board. Here's the RAM board. This was a 4K board that was populated with 2K of RAM. So your system came with 2K. And then in the back, this smaller card is a serial interface board that would go out to your terminal through this connector right here. Now, this board uses the 6850 um, ACIA, which is a UART, a true serial port. In the original, this was actually based on the 6820, which is a parallel interface chip and the serial I.O. was bit banged. That's the way the MicBug Prom wanted to do its I.O. So Southwest copied that because the MicBug Prom, which was provided by Motorola, wanted to do it that way. All right, let's take a quick look at these boards. The CPU board, of course, here's the Motorola 6800 over there on the left. Down at the bottom is the MicBug Prom, and that again is just a standard Motorola product. Above that is a, slot, a socket where normally a 128-byte scratch pad RAM is. That RAM is used by MicBug. Now, 
And this configuration I have here, that's actually done on an external card. So that's why that uh, chip is not in there. But in the beginning, that chip would have been there. Um, so it didn't need any external RAM for MicBug to actually run. And here's the RAM card. Again, it's a 4K RAM card that was sold with just 2K stuffed um, to make it where you could incrementally pay for more if you want it. Now you also see that we have a full motherboard here. And that's got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slots in it already. Instead of 100 pin sockets, these are 50 pin male headers. Um, and it's a very strong connection, very hard to get on and off, frankly, a lot of good insertion force. So it was quite reliable. Um, and as you can tell, it was 50 pins instead of the 100 used with the Altair and the S100 standard that eventually developed. So um, there's a little bit simpler interface on all these cards. There's a, a chip or two less that required to inter interface. Then in the back, you see at a right angle here, we have a whole nother bus with 30 pins. This one was called the SS50 bus. This one is called the SS30 bus. What they did is went ahead and put some decoding logic here that takes everything in the 2K chunk of memory from 8,000 hex up to 81FF and decodes, pre-decodes these eight slots for I.O. So the 6800 used memory mapped I.O. as opposed to the I.O. instruction of the 8080. So these slots were pre-decoded. That meant these boards didn't have to have much on them other than the actual logic to implement their function because they didn't need any of the bus interface logic for the most part. So you can see how simple that board is. The serial interface board on the Altair, for example, took a full size board and full slot on the bus. Therefore, it was more expensive. Um, so speaking of expense, this computer, again, as you see here, was basically 395. So you've got the CPU board, you've got a full motherboard ready to expand with uh, seven slots plus peripheral slots, and you've got a 2K of RAM, and you've got a serial interface. By the time you added those same things to the Altair, its price at the same time in uh, history was up to $773. So when equivalent systems were configured, this was almost half the price down there at $395. Um, so it was a very, very good deal, and you could actually come out of the box and be running a little bit quicker because of this MicBug drum. And we're going to see that in the next video. Not only did it allow you to examine and change memory and jump to a location, you could actually set a breakpoint and see the instruction registers, which came in handy for debugging. And you could also punch and reload from paper tape without having to write your own programs. You could do it from a command. So if you had a teletype as a terminal, which of course was quite common in the day, you could get up and running with a program very, very quickly on this. And that's what we're going to demonstrate in the very next video. All right, so that's the introduction of the 6800, and uh, take a look at the next video to see us programming with it and punching and saving tapes.